loud and down the music here and we'll get started. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a workshop on testing business ideas with David Bland. We're really excited to have you join us. My name is Cameron Law and I serve as the executive director here at the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I'm joined by two of our team members. We have Arlene Miranda, who heads up our marketing and operations. She can give the big wave. And then we also have Brian Gladden, who serves as our entrepreneur in residence. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Carlson Center, we serve as a regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to enable startup founders of all backgrounds to start and scale their businesses. And ultimately, we're on this mission to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region and truly build this region into being a premier hub for innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, we're excited to have you joining us here today and gaining some new tools and frameworks to support you in that entrepreneurial endeavor. And so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Brian on our team who will more formally introduce David. And we're um, lucky to have him here in the space to share more about testing business ideas. So take it away, Brian, and thank you all for joining us. And thank you, David, for, for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Cameron. And I'll uh, very similar slide to what Cameron was just uh, sharing, but uh... I want to definitely say thank you to David and welcome him for joining us today. Uh, David, if you don't know, for those of you joining us, now resides in the Sacramento region next to us here at Carlson Center in Sac State. So very excited. And I've been working with David and learning from him for the past few years. So we're excited that he's helping our ecosystem uh, expand and you know, raise the tide for all entrepreneurs. In my practice outside of the Carlson Center um, Strategy Innovation Institute, I use David's you know, methods and works, assumptions mapping, testing ideas, right? Um, reducing your risk. And so it's really important for entrepreneurs, for startups, even corporations who are looking to test new ideas so they don't waste a bunch of time and effort on things that no one cares about to understand how to do it and change the mindset, understand the tools, David ha helps obviously organizations um, test ideas, you know, lean startup methodologies, business model techniques, working with Alex Osterwalder, strategizer of the new book you see there, see it over my shoulder. Um, I suggest you get it, it's the Bible for testing ideas. And David has been on many, many years working on these concepts and tools, Pioneer G Fastworks with Eric Reese, who created Lean Startup works with many of the Silicon Valley accelerators and now here with us in the Sacramento region. And so without further ado, I wanna say thanks and pass it over to David to share with us and you all how to reduce risk and test your ideas to validate that it, it's actually something you should pursue. David, take it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the introduction. So uh, I'm going to be walking through, I'm not going to use slides today. I'm going to use a, a product called Mural, M-U-R-A-L. Uh, full disclosure, I do advise this company, but I just happen to like their tools. So it's, it's nice to advise companies where you actually like their products. And um, I'm going to basically be going through overall just a behind the scenes of how, you know, I approach this work. And then hopefully, you know, we can get some Q&A and we do a little interaction. So you all aren't just watching me draw and, and talk, it's, which is fun for me. But, you know, I like for you all to interact too. So I'll drop a link later in chat for you all to join me on this board. And you'll have access to this for, uh, I usually archive about after 30 days. So uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about is from the book, Testing Business Ideas. It's almost three years old now. Uh, November, it'll be three years old. And uh, it's probably worth like 10 years of coaching and then another 10 years of startup experience I have. So yeah, I think that's why it's easy to write your first first, but not, not that writing a book is easy by any means. But I think it's easier to write a first book because it's something you've probably been thinking about for a long time. And you know, I think it's always the second book that's harder because <laughs> it's like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> and it's like, uh, so I think that's why it's harder to write a second book. But however, we'll see. But anyway, with this one, um, it's a lot of like my personal lived experiences at startups, you know, uh, started for 11 years. Uh, one was successful, two were not. And then uh, just coaching a bunch of startups, a bunch of accelerators, a bunch of big companies over the last 10 years or over 10 years now. Um, it just, it just, I've learned so much. And so a lot of the book is just me uh, channeling my coaching kind of experience into a book is really all it is. 
And so I feel like that was really good advice from my editor, which was like, write the book like you're coaching teams. I was like, oh, I know I coach teams because that's all I, do, <laughs> all I do. So it was really easy to kind of translate that into a book uh, to some extent anyway. Um, so the learning objective today is basically like, hey, let, let me help you with your product and business ideas. It could be something you just came up with. It could be something you're working on on the side. It could be something that it is you have a few maybe customers interested, but you don't have really a product market fit yet. It's not ready to scale. That's usually where I play. That's where I feel like um, I bring the most value is, is this, I, from idea to product market fit. Like that squishiness, uncertain area, that, that is where uh, hopefully today I can help you kind of uh, at least think about risk a different way and open up your repertoire of experiments so that you, are, like, you can run some experiments to generate the evidence you need. Um, I do have a code of conduct for everything I do, which is pretty much the Bill and Ted code of conduct, which is be excellent to one another. So just keep that in mind when we're, when we're sharing out to just be respectful in tone and how you give feedback. All right, so let's jump in. So um, I love this framing of risk. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I kind of picked this up in design school, but it goes back for like human-centered design. It goes back for quite a ways. And if you Google this, you're going to see stuff from me. You're going to see stuff from Larry Keeley, from Stanford D School, from IDEO from mind the product, like it's, it's kind of everywhere now, uh, which is good. Like it's kind of good that it's everywhere because uh, pretty much we need to be thinking this way when we're developing something new. Um, and so the way I look at risk around this is sort of like, all right, so we have this idea of um, desirability and kind of do they want this? And so that's more about the value proposition and jobs, pains and gains of the customer and what kind of risk do you have there? We have this idea of kind of viability, which is more, should we do this? It's not necessarily just like, should we from an ethical point of view, granted you should make those like ethical business decisions. In addition to that, it's, it's like, is it sustainable? Is it viable? Is it like, should we do this from a financial point of view? And even for nonprofits I work with, they have to show impact for the money they raise. So is this viable? Is this something that we should be working on? And then we kind of have this backstage, which is more feasible, which is like, can we do this? And yes, that's technical feasibility, but it's also regulatory compliance, governance, there should be, there could be other reasons beyond your technical ability to deliver that might prevent you from, you know, succeeding. And so when you think about it that way, it's like, we have to address all three of these. Now you don't have to address all three at once, but you do have to think about all these. And, and I work with a ton of different industries and it doesn't matter if it's like something in space or something like deep sea exploration or it's a consumer product, or it's a car, or it's just software, an app, or service, it doesn't matter. You need to keep these three things in mind. And so where I see people trip up is, is pretty common. First off, they focus on only desirability and viability. And so what happens here is they say, well, people want this. We have evidence that people want it. And they're even willing to pay for it. Like maybe they even pre-order or they crowdfund it. And if you don't address feasibility though, you're going to fail in a big way, not a small way. And so think about all the crowdfunding campaigns, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, where it was like, oh wow, what happened to that thing I funded? <laughs> it's like, it probably went away because it wasn't feasible. You know, they tried to outsource their production and, and like hardware and software and it was really complicated and, or the regulator shut them down. There's all kinds of reasons, but you know, you just have to be aware of if people are saying they want this and they're willing to give you money, that is great. That's a great spot to be in. However, don't neglect the backstage risk of being able to deliver on that value at that price point. Because what happens sometimes is like, oh, wow, it just, it just costs a lot more to create it than we thought. And if that's the case, then you're not going to make any money. <laughs> you know. And so there's all these things about the backstage feasibility that I want you to think about when you're thinking about risk, it's not just desirability and viability. You also have to worry about the, can we do this question? So let's say you focus in a couple other areas. Let's say you focused in desirability and feasibility, but not viability. So let's say people want it and you can build it, but you never really worked out the cost structure of what it's going to cost to do this and whether or not they'll pay a high enough price point. Well, you're still going to fail in a big way not a small way here, because basically what happens is people love it and you can deliver it, but it'll, it'll never sustain. And I think a lot of the products we, we know and love that are no longer around, a lot of them fall prey to this. You know, they were awesome products, but for whatever reason, they just, they weren't viable long-term. 
like you just either, either the channels were too expensive or weren't mature um the partners didn't work out uh with regards to driving the cost down you know there's there's all this stuff around like we just never were able to do it at a low enough price point at a high enough uh or low enough cost at a high enough price point so that's another reason i see things fail and then finally and I'm, i have to say i still see this and i wish i didn't it, it's kind of like this one down here right so it's feasible we we can do it and it's viable, but then nobody cares. <laughs> like literally nobody, like this is where kind of the whole lean startup movement got its momentum was we just got tired of building things nobody wanted, you know? And I lived that at two startups, so I could tell you it's not enjoyable. I mean, some people will, will probably say, well, you know, hey, I'm making a paycheck and I'm going to work and you know, whether people want it or not, it's kind of not my problem it's eventually going to be your problem. <laughs> like the company will go away <laughs> if nobody wants it. And so, well, usually anyway. And so, you know, what I've found is that when I meet like these innovators and entrepreneurs all around the world, they, they have this drive and, and you kind of want to, you want to create stuff that people value in the end, you know? So you can have a lot of fun like building things, but if no one uses them or they don't, provide like they don't provide some kind of gain they're looking for or solve a pain that they have or help them accomplish a job that they're trying to do and that covers like most of the bases there then it, it's it's going to be tough and so when you think about risk right you kind of want to address desirability and viability you want to address feasibility right desirability you also want to address feasible and viable so essentially you know eventually you want to get here in the middle where you're addressing all three phases of risk. And one of the big things in my consulting is that, you know, when I'm helping teams, because I help a lot of teams behind the scenes, in addition to this kind of work and my public work I do, I ask them like, what are you worried about? <laughs> and there's a good chance when they say what they're worried about, it falls into one of these three buckets. They're worried about nobody wanting it. They're worried about people wanting it, but not paying enough for it. Or they're worried about like their ability to deliver on it. And so you don't always have to use these words. But if you're really trying to unpack from people or even like your own work, like, what am I really worried about? I find these three buckets, desirable, viable, feasible, are really good at teasing it out and unpacking it. So something to think about as far as how to frame things. So what we've been doing, and some of you may already know this tool, my co-author Alex Osterwalder created it a little over 10 years ago called the Business Model Canvas. Um, it's still taught in almost every accelerator I go into. Um, I can't say it's always taught well, <laughs> but it is taught. Um, hopefully today you'll get a better uh, understanding of it just from just hanging out with me. But basically we noticed that people were kind of treating it as a checklist and people weren't understanding the relationships between things. And then they were having a hard time understanding where to focus. And so it's a great tool, but what we did and what Alex and Eve did, and I think testing business ideas might be the first book where we published this, but they were doing it before the book, which is, can we layer in some of this thinking that works desirable, viable, feasible onto this tool and give it a little bit more uh, color, so to speak. So one of the ways we do that is you look at desirability. It's not perfect, but you look at the top, right? It's a lot of desirability risk, like your value prop, your customer segments, how you get to them, relationships. The viability, when we talk about the pricing, right? It's a lot of cost and revenue. You know, it's like, can we do this at a low enough cost at a high enough price point to generate revenue, right? When you look at feasibility, it's more a backstage. So it's your activities and resources and partners. Like what's your ability to essentially deliver on this? And so the only hard time, like, the only problem I have with this framing is that it looks like it's completely separate. Like when we do it this way, but they're all related. You can tell like, if you, if it costs a lot to make it and it drives up your, your costs, and then that drives up your price and then it might shrink your market. <laughs> you know? So they're all very related, but I like this framing because it helps people understand, oh, what kind of risk do I have? And so when I'm helping people really fill this out, it's not like a left or right tool. Uh, I, I tend to start over here with customer segments. So I say, Hey, who's your customer segments? Uh, like behavioral market, like what are the top three, for example, that you're, they're going after. And then what's your value to them? Now, not your product, right? Uh, the value your product creates. And this is something recent I've been doing with teams over the last couple of years. 
mean, I had a write up of this uh, last month, even where I said, think about your kind of product as almost like a resource. So if you have a, a platform or a physical or software, whatever your product is, try not to put it like front and center as like the value. Most people don't care that much about your product. They care about like the value your product creates for them. You know, does it solve a job they're trying to do? Does it address a pain point they have? Does it create a gain for them? And so while the product, yes, is important, it's more like the value they get out of it's a bit more important. So that, so when you think about number two, try to think about not just your product, but think about what's the value my product creates. And then distribution channels. So think about acquisition channels. How do you reach your customers? Think about distribution channels. How do you distribute your value to them? So what kind of channels do you have? And then by far the hardest box in the whole thing, in my opinion, is customer relationships. So what's the nature of the relationship you have with your customer? Is it impersonal? Is it automated? Is it face to face? Is it ongoing? Is it one time? Is it over, you know, a series of months or years? Is it just, you know, uh, like a one time thing and they're gone? But what's the nature of that relationship with your customers? So you notice one, two, three, four, I kind of jump around a bit when I'm filling this out. All that's desirability risk, pretty much. It's like, well, if we get the customer wrong and we get our value prop wrong, it's going to be really tough no matter what else we do. And so usually teams I'm starting out with and, and entrepreneurs and innovators who have something like really, really new, this is where they focus a lot of their time and effort and energy, which we'll get to in a minute, which is a lot of desirability risk. Um, then I tend to jump down to, okay, how do you generate revenue? Like what are your revenue streams for this? All right. From there, I back up to, all right, so what are the activities? So think of verbs, what are the key activities you need to do to make this happen? Resources, so physical, digital, like what are the things you need or even people that you need to make this work? What's this cost? And then who do you partner with? So let me zoom out a bit here and try it this way for you all. So one of the reasons um, this tool kind of stuck with me. So I first met Alex, I think in San Francisco, I don't know, it's 2010 or 11 or something. Um, he was doing a master class at Fort Mason and he did this thing. It stuck with me. He was like, Hey, this is might all see overwhelming to you. But if you think about this way, let me, uh, let's see if I can draw this way. Yeah. So if you think about, if you kind of like almost split it down the middle, this is almost like the front stage. So imagine you're going to, um, oops, I'll zoom out a little bit more for you or drag it down. Um, like you're going to a play. So what you see as an audience and the stage, like that's kind of like the front stage of your business model, that visible interaction between your customer and your value, all right? But there's all this stuff that happens behind the scenes, which is more like backstage. And the backstage is all that stuff that happens behind the play, like the set design, getting the sets in and out, uh, getting costumes changed, getting people in the right places with the right lines and everything. That's a lot of the work you don't see that goes on to, to create the value. Okay. And so with that kind of framing, you could see, well, there, there's like a relationship between this stuff. So for example, for the front stage to work, you know, you have to deliver your value to customers. You know, you have to build some like type of relationship with them and they pay for it some indirectly or directly. So there, there's an element of revenue from them. And then if you think backstage, well, you can look at your activities and resources and say, well, these are my costs because I can look at those and derive my costs from them. And if I partner with somebody, they're probably bringing an activity either I don't want to do or can't do or a resource I don't have or can't create, or maybe don't want to create, or maybe even a channel that helps me get to my customers. And so when you look, start looking at it this way, you can start looking at, zoom out a bit for you. You can start looking at the relationships of like the front stage and backstage of your business model. And so it's kind of a deeper usage of it. Maybe I hate to say more advanced usage, but really, if you're going to get value out of tools like these, you need to understand that it's for visualizing your strategy, creating a shared language, and then being able to kind of focus on where your risk is. And so I think one of the reasons it's sustained for so long is because it, it does a lot of that really well. And, and we test it and learn and, and update it based on what we've learned. And so one of the things we've been doing is just trying to capture what are the big assumptions you're making 
in, in this model as a team or even on by yourself. And so I like colors. So I use orange, green, and blue, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, so I use orange for the desirability portion. Let's see this part like here, this is all orange, right? And then I use green for viability. And this helps me with the mapping that I'll get to in a minute. And I use blue for all the feasibility. Okay. And so when you look at it that way, you should have people around you or, you know, or you can answer these that can go into what are the things that would have to be true for this model to work, for our strategy to work. And I think that's a, a big departure from how we usually approach things, right? Or at least even back in my day when we first started like the dot-com era of startups, right? Uh, that was the first startup I joined is dot-com era. And uh, we would just kind of like march forward, you know, like... Here's our plan, you know, and we had no idea what we were doing. And, you know, it needs to be more iterative, right? We need to come back and say, well, here are some things that we wrote down. We think are good that have to be true, but like some of these, we know some of these, we don't, and some of there's evidence, some don't have evidence. And, and so one of the reasons I created this two by two, um, with the help of, uh, Jeff Goth, Elf and Josh Seiden, who I used to work with, um, it's called, I'll, I'll just write it out here for you all. Uh, it's called assumptions mapping. So this is used by Google. It's used by uh, a ton of companies all around the world uh, and governments too, like governments use this now. It's just a really basic two by two to help people understand where to focus all this stuff you just wrote down. And so what we do is we start bringing it over. So we have all these, we believe statements and I like writing them as statements, not necessarily like questions. I feel like it's harder to map as a question. So I like the statements and I like the, we believe, because it's, it may be sound kind of nuanced, but you're, you're actually opening up to the fact that you're willing to, like, it's a belief you might be willing to test <laughs> is why like we believe. And so what we do is we start pulling these over. And so first off, it's like, how important is this to the success of our business? And how much evidence do we have for this? Now I could say just having probably facilitated hundreds or maybe thousands of these at this point. Um, this part isn't too hard. So we believe, let me bring this to front. Uh, we believe that didn't work. Okay. Uh, we believe like this is really important or yeah, it's kind of like, if this is false, we're going to be okay. So it's not the most important thing. The place where people struggle is this one. And I'll zoom in a bit here. This evidence, this is really tricky for teams I'm working with. It's like, some of the teams I noticed, they'll say, well, I talked to a customer, so I validated that. So we, we got the evidence. It's like, mm, maybe. <laughs> evidence is, there are different variant, there are different levels of evidence and there are different certain like, how do I explain this? Um, it's like the quantity and the type that matter. And so I'll sketch this out for you a moment because I find that my teams are really struggling with this part. So. If you just talk to one customer and they said they would want it, I would put that way over here. Like that's not much evidence whatsoever. You know, especially if this is really important, it's probably over here somewhere. So what I thought I'd do is I'm just gonna, um, let's find a spot here on my board to describe evidence for you. My board's all cluttered up. Let's do it over here. So Matt, sorry about my dragging everything around. Just bear with me a moment. All right, so let's, let's talk about evidence because I really want this to sink in with everybody here. So when we're talking evidence, we tried to do this in the book, but I don't know if it came across super well. So let's talk about, um, let me uh, scoot over a bit more. Okay, let's do it like this. So let's talk about strength of evidence. Hopefully my drawing catches up with my train of thought here. All right. So the way we try to uh, frame this in the book was weak and strong. And we've since moved on from that, um, mostly because I didn't like the weak framing and Alex didn't either. So think about this way. Think about light, light evidence and strong evidence. All right. So with light evidence and strong evidence, depending on the experiment you choose and, and what you have as far as like uh, informing those or supporting or refuting those assumptions you have, um, there are different kind of like, ways to calibrate your team and calibrate their confidence. So first off is a really, really basic one. It's like what people say versus what they do. Okay. 
what they say is pretty light evidence, right? Especially on future hypothetical situations where they say they would buy a thing or they say they would use your thing. Don't take a lot, a lot. I mean, don't pet, don't, don't place big bets on stuff like that, that people say. There's a lot of cognitive reasons to, to not do that. Instead, you really want to try to work towards of like what they would do in real life. Another thing about evidence is you can look at opinions and look at facts, right? Opinions are pretty light evidence, but you want to drive to facts on, on basically like, even in your interviews, you could do this by having them explain things that happened in the past, right? Like facts, what factually happened is one way to think about this. There's also what you do in the lab versus the real world. And I like lab settings. It's fine. Like if you have people invited in to come into your office or they're, they're, you're using user testing.com or, or one of those things, it, it's just obvious that it's a lab setting. It's not in the real world. It's, it's kind of a, a, the context biases people a bit. And so that's also pretty light evidence. And then you think about the investment cost of, let's say the customer, even if it's a low investment, and I'll abbreviate here. So let's say it's like an email versus a high investment, which is, let's say money, they're paying for it. Okay. Oh my gosh. Let's see. Hopefully my drawing <laughs> keeps up, to, keeps up to this. It kind of like skittered out here a bit. Anyway. Um, it's starting to think about it. So there we go. So with, um, I told you there was a the challenge of like, it might not keep up with my train of thought. So with low investment, let's say um, they're giving up their email. That's not something I'd place a big bet on. I think people give up their email for all kinds of stuff. Like think about how many landing pages you go to and just give up your email to be notified. And then you forget even why you signed up for it. <laughs> Versus high investment where you're paying, like you're prepaying. Um, think like early days Tesla, you know, they, they sold a hundred roadsters for a hundred thousand us dollars a piece. That's not bad. hundred pre-orders for a hundred thousand PS dollars each. And people like could cancel up until the point that they shipped, right? That's very high up. That's very strong evidence, right? That's high investment costs. So the way I, the way I'm like rambling on about this for a bit is we have to move away from eventually, I don't think you have to move away from it right at the beginning, but you have to move away from what people say with their opinions in a lab setting with low investment to a stronger strength of evidence where it's what they do with facts in the real world with the high investment. All right. And so you think about like social sciences, this is really what we're pulling from here. And so when you think about evidence that way, when you go to map, when people say, Oh, I have evidence. I talked to a customer. I validated that. You can say, well, what people say is, is kind of light evidence. And it was just one customer. And was it, did like, did he do anything else? Well, no, they just kind of said they wanted it. Right. So it was like, well, no, that goes closer to here. We, we'd like to move it over there for sure, but it has to be on something they do in the real world with a higher investment cost. And so once you get one mapped, when you bring up the next one, you say, is this more or less important? And do I have more or less evidence? So it goes pretty quickly once you get one mapped, because you can start walking through where they are relative to one another. So I find that first one is kind of tricky. Let's zoom out a bit here. But once you start getting them in, they go by pretty quickly. And what you end up with is this really interesting map of the risk of your idea. Now you're probably wrong, <laughs> but it's like, how wrong are you, right? And, and so that's something we struggle with because we do a map like this. We want to get it right the first time. I can tell you, you're not going to get it right. But there are degrees of getting it wrong. And so what happens is you end up focusing on what, you know, uh, what Eric would say, like Eric Reese would say, he would say like, this is a leap of faith, right? So these are the things that have to be true for this to work. So you're looking for stuff with the most important to your business success with the least amount of evidence, all right? And from there, from there, we go and run experiments based off of, based off that risk. Okay. So in the book, we have 44 different experiments. You know, um, there's many, many more than that, but basically the way we describe them is uh, through discovery and through validation. So discovery, uh, when you think of strength of evidence, it's a lot of light evidence right? It's like directional evidence. You're trying to basically 
uh, find out what people say with their opinions, you know, like in a lab setting with low investment, and that's fine. That'll give you some level of direction, right? But when you get to al validation, it's going to be more about what people do in the real world. There's a value exchange. They're paying for something. And so a lot of the conversations about MVPs end up being uh, in the validation side. When you say MVP or minimum viable product, they end up being um, like these things you do that exchange value and you can learn from. So we don't have time to get in all 44 of these today, but the reason we did this was we felt like the mapping would help people choose, okay? And so when you think about the mapping, and, and, and I don't think people suffer from lists of stuff. What I find when I help try to help people, it's like, I don't know what to choose for my situation. I don't know what to choose for my scenario. And so what we've did, uh, what we did in the, in the book is that we said, look, these are the ones in how, like, it's not perfect, but it's like how much they cost, right? Are these really expensive, cheap, or, or like almost free? Like, where are they on a spectrum? We also went through and categorized these by setup time and runtime. So you can start to understand, oh, this takes like almost no time to set up, but it might take a while to run. Or this might take a long time to set up, but we can run it pretty quickly. It gives you just an idea of time that's going to be invested in it. And then we do tackle evidence strength. Uh, we try to give a guide of whether it's going to be strong evidence or light evidence, depending on what you're trying to do. We also cover, remember the themes I was talking about earlier? Desirability and feasibility and viability, they're here in each experiment. And so what happens is you can uh, say, mm, I have a lot of desirability risk. Oh, here's a selection of desirability experiments that won't cost me a lot of money that I could go run to, to hopefully generate evidence to prove or disprove that thing. Okay. So I think this is the real value of, of the book. And we also have capabilities that you'll need is it's almost like just your library of experiments. And as you get more practice with this, you're going to be able to create your own sequences, your own like recipes for how to validate things versus like hardware, software, no matter what you're working in, it gives you like, I don't want to say like superpowers to figure out how to do this. Now with concierge, you'll notice this one's like a manual one and you'll notice it tests all three themes. We're testing feasibility back here because we're manually doing the thing, right? We're not having a lot of tech. Um, we're just trying to manually say, can we deliver this value at all? Even if it's just us, so it doesn't scale. It tests desirability because you're getting feedback from the customer here. And then you're testing viability, which is more cost, remember, because you're charging for it. And you can kind of do back on the napkin math of what's it take to actually do this and deliver it. So it doesn't scale, right? This does not scale. But you can learn so much from this that once you run this experiment, and this is what happens with teams I work with, you can use it to inform what you automate, which is really cool. It's not automating based on wouldn't it be cool if, it's more like we're automating it based on real evidence we generated <laughs> by delivering the thing. And this one is a little different than Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz, it's not obvious there's a person involved. So it's very similar, except you might put a bot or something, you know, on a page in between the customer and your team. And so I've done both. Um, we have like a lot of different scenarios here, but basically there's all kinds of stuff you can do, but this is just one. And, and what you're doing is you're trying to match what your, your activity is to your risk. And so the goal isn't to just run experiments. The goal is to pay down the risk in, in your business and your product service idea. So what I thought might be fun is let me put a link in here. So those of you who have, uh, you don't have to create an account, so you can use this for free. Just, you just basically join as anonymous squirrel or something, just enter as visitor and that'll let you create, create stickies. So this is the board I've been presenting from. So you all can join me if you want. And, uh, what I did is I put a cheat sheet to the book in here. So Tendai Vicky helped create these for me. He's an associate partner at Strategizer. Um, these are, they're not as detailed as the book but it's a really good resource. Again, this'll, this'll be up for 30 days for you, but these are all um, like little PDFs of cards from the book. And so for example, let's say, um, let's say you didn't know what a feature stub was, right? So we can't get through all 44 today, but if you double click on that guy, um, it's a PDF. And so all I ask is you don't share these publicly, but basically you can scroll in, but this is a higher resolution anyway, it's a PDF. And you can say, oh, a feature stub, it's discovery. And it's a small test of an upcoming feature that's the very beginning of the experience, so former button. Google does this to me like all the time. Uh, 
I'll click on something. It's like, we're not ready yet. And then how likely would you be blah, 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 like kind of survey or something or sign up with a call to action. So I see these with my teams when they're just, oh my gosh, they're, they're like stuck in these meetings where they just say, I think it's a terrible idea. I think it's a great idea. And they're talking about a feature to add to something. <laughs> and then instead we go, Hey, let's just run an experiment and see if there's any directional evidence that either one of us is right, you know, and so they're just arguing around and around. And so this one, uh, it doesn't take long to run and you get really good evidence strength because it's something you would put in your live product, but you don't run it for very long and you don't experiment on everybody, right. Or with everybody, you, you kind of, um, uh, target a very specific segment and say, here's a thing. Will they even click on it if it's there? And it's, it's not like make or break your entire product kind of important, but it's something that would give you directional evidence. But anyway, that's just one. And so what I thought we could do is you could check out. So I see some of you are in the board here. So click if you're, you're in chat. And what I thought we could do is like you all could just um, browse these. So we have the validation ones at the bottom and we have the, uh, the discovery ones here at the top. And so I'll use kind of a fun example <laughs> that, I, that I've used before here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to use a different example today. I'm going to do a different example. Uh, I'll do this one on the fly for you. But um, if you have trouble navigating this, by the way, just give me a UI kind of tip here. The hand at the bottom right, depending on if you're a laptop or uh, if, you're on a, if you're on an iPad, it's a little different because it's like pinching and whatever. But if you're on a, a laptop or you have a mouse, um, you can use that hand to drag around. And if you want to create a sticky, you unclick that and you just double click to create a sticky. Okay. So just giving you like some basic uh, guidelines there. Okay. So while you check that out, I'm going to run through a real example with you all. And so um, I'm going to do an example from a um, major car manufacturer, a well-known car manufacturer. Let's put it that way. So let's say, um, we'll say um, this idea is your car can pay for anything. Let's just call it that project. That's not exactly what we called it, but it's pretty much what it was. All right, so your car can pay for anything. So how would you test that? Well, I can tell with the team I was working with on it, the first thing we did were our customer interviews. So yes, we could build a very elaborate system to have your car pay for anything on your behalf. So your coffee, your parking, your gas, whatever, that mobile payments support, just do it to your car and automatically pay. However, um, we didn't know if anybody had any issues around that. Like, do they have issues where they're trying to pay and the car could help or they forgot their wallet or their phone died or whatever it is. They didn't, you know, uh, we did customer interviews on that. Next we did paper prototyping. So we paper prototyped out what, uh, I'll zoom in a bit for you all too. There's just some screen share here. Um, we paper prototyped what it could do. And we also tested those with customers too. So very lightweight sketches. And I think we're always nervous to do that, but the kind of feedback you get on something that's a sketch is not that should be red or blue because it's just a sketch. It's more like, oh, well, I don't know if I'd find that valuable because X, Y, Z, or, oh, I could have used that in this point in the past, right, on a trip or something. We also did a clickable prototype. So with a clickable prototype, what we did is we basically made our paper, we refined it a little bit and we made it clickable and it was something we could hand to people that they could interact with. So like on a tablet or on a phone, and it didn't work behind the scenes at all, but we got different feedback from just the customer interviews where they would just talk. It's like a blizzard of words sometimes coming at you. The clickable thing, you'd be interested to know, and some of you may have experienced this, the type of feedback you get when they click is a little different because their brain is processing it different ways. And it's just, it's just really cool. Okay, then we did a landing page. Uh, this was a landing page with a call to action for the service. And we also made an explainer video. Um, and then we ended up putting that on the page. But basically, we had an explainer video, the value prop. And this was all informed by like the previous work, right? What we learned in the interviews, what we learned in paper prototyping, what we learned in clickable. We use that to inform the landing page. So one of the tricks here that I think most teams forget is that the quotes you hear in your interviews, you can use in the copy on your landing page, which I think is amazing. Because so often the words you use, people just don't know what you're talking about. And that's why they don't click. <laughs> and that's why they don't put their email in. So uh, that's, that's really important. Um, and then we did, um, I'll call it a mashup. So we took an Android tablet and we hacked it into a car and used iBeacon and had a working, I would say, MVP, uh, minimum viable product that would allow people to pay for things through their car. 
All right. So this is a real project. This is something I worked on with, with a giant auto manufacturer. Now, um, one of the things I liked about how we approached it. So if you think of it from a sequence point of view, um, let me refresh my thing here. So from a sequence point of view, we could have easily built a really expensive system that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and rolled it out and saw what happened. Like, oh yeah, we'll just see what happens. Like, so many things still go that way, especially in the car industry. But what we did instead is we said, look, we took what we learned from this to inform this. We took what we learned from this to inform this. Like the prototype to inform the landing page, that to help with the video that we in turn put on the page, that to help a trial MVP, okay? When we got to this part, remember, remember the, the, the uh, themes I shared with you, desirable, viable, feasible? Uh, was it feasible? Yes. The, the, it's kind of a pain. Like we literally crashed payment systems when we did this, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> like we could literally charge money with the car through the APIs to payment systems. Could make that work. Was it viable? Eh, kinda. Like it costs a lot. <laughs> so imagine, just imagine this. Imagine one of your biggest car companies in the world wants your car to pay for Starbucks. Then you think about all the Starbucks you would have to integrate with. And then you think about all the cars and different models and different makes. It adds up quickly, really, really. I mean, it, it's a lot of money, let's put it that way. And so we weren't sure if this was viable. Like that would have been a lot of money to figure out, do people care? And then we come to desirability. Do people care? Nope, nobody cared. Like, <laughs> sorry, my ex is coming through. Uh, not all these have a happy ending and nobody cared. Um, pretty much people were like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'd use it once. Like, oh, okay, we're going to spend a hundred million dollars <laughs> for something you use once to pay for like parking and then never again. Like that was, it was, a, it was just, I'm not saying it was a terrible idea. I don't think it's a terrible idea. I think the market will eventually catch up to the point where this makes sense but we are not there yet. And so I rem this reminds me of like the first dot-com era, right? I see so many startups that just, the only reason our startup was successful is we hired all our friends from the, their failed startups and they came to work at our startup. And that's one of the reasons we were successful. And a lot of them were great ideas, but the timing was just all wrong. And I know this because I see startups today that are almost the exact same ideas that we had in the late nineties and they're, wildly successful. And it's because like the internet's matured and the way that people like behave is different. Like back then you're not going to get in a stranger's car to be driven somewhere through an app today. You're like, yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Let's <laughs> jump in a stranger's car. Like so much has changed. And so I do think we will get to the point that this will work, but for our timing on it, it was not. So, but what I liked was that we used experiments to inform this and go through the process. So that's kind of a fun, real example I wanted to share with you. What I want you all to do, if you're up for it. So here's the link again. So join the board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer here for, we're going to do seven minutes on this one. I'll play some music. What I want you to do is check out, I'll scroll over here for you a bit. Check out these experiments, okay? And then I would love for you under one I created here, your car can pay for anything, which was killed <laughs> is what are some serious experiments you think might help what you're working on? And you could just do sticky note level, like just like I did, you could just double click type, right? Do a next one next to it, right? Type. That's all, that's all level I want. I don't want you to go down the acceptance criteria. I don't want you to think about integrations. I just want you to stay at the sticky note level for today. Okay. But I think it'd be really valuable for you to go through some of these and be like, Hmm, I think this might work for what I'm working on. And then we can share out and do some Q and A and some fun stuff. Okay. So seven minutes, I'll play some music and in the board, click the link to join and go.
about four minutes left. I like the uh, ransom note here. I'm learning mural. That's that's good. Yeah, it's it's kind of like double click to make stickies, pretty much, and you can drag the corners to make it bigger, smaller. About two minutes left. All right, try to finish up. So, who would like to review? You can get feedback from me. So, hey, like I'm hanging out here, so I can give you some feedback on uh, one of the sequences you came up with. So, maybe just like unmute and say, hey, this is what I'm working on, and here are some of the things I'm thinking about. And, and I can give you feedback on what you could try or any questions. So, who would like to go? And I'm not going to eviscerate you in front of everybody because it's not my style. So, if you're nervous, still don't, don't need to be. If no one wants to go, I'll break the ice so you guys don't feel bad. I'll be the guinea pig for David. So I, I'm the one uh, here that uh, did the the D and the V discovery and validation. So, and it's a uh, a real disposable medical product that helping a startup get to market. 
And the biggest problem is viability, not desirability. So making sure people actually pay for this because it's really a new market that people aren't really aware of or putting two uh, jobs to be done and problems together. So um, discovery, obviously interviews, a lot of search trends. So people can understand uh, or the, the new startup, the key messaging, uh, since they're putting several things together and then uh, some social media to discover and maybe uh, discussion forums on early adopters and real issues they're having for validation with a video as well and how it works. And the big one I think is the viability for, for them is letters of intent, you know, um, pre-sale, getting feedback for landing pages on uh, resonating what works. So that uh, seemed to be ones I thought would be really good from a viability uh, standpoint. Very cool. I think um, a couple things. So with landing pages, I think one of the nuances of landing pages is that depending on what you're on there, you can test different things, what you're putting on there. So it could be uh, just value prop early on, right? You just have your page and you have what it's about and with a call to action with email. And that's enough to get some early desirability feedback on it. You can also, when you do your interviews, you could show the page to people. You can have them explain back to you what they think it means. And you should start to know, are you dialed in on the words on the page? And then later on, you can add in a video and you can add in some pricing. And it could be pricing tiers. It could be um, like with pricing products, you could do something like a single use versus a subscription or something like that. And then it's like, hey, we'll let you know when we're ready, you know? And, you know, you can keep iterating on it to the point where you're testing early stage desirability, but then you work into viability. And it's never really gonna help you test feasibility, but you can take people that place orders and you can like manually deliver them, right? I, I even do this with physical products. Some of the companies I work with, we have a page and almost like a wait list kind of thing or pre-order. We don't want a bunch of pre-orders, right? We just want a few. And then I have a team that would literally like hand ship them, right? I had a team using, um, one of my teams were just, just shipping them out like FedEx, <laughs> like QPS manually. I had another team that spun up um, a Shopify store and then they manually created the things um, for designers and they shipped them out that way. Um, but that one was like, it was, it was powered behind the page, right? But it was able to uh, also reach out to those people and get feedback from them, right? And so we never made the inventory really big on the products. We kept it pretty small, but our pages evolved, right? We went from, do you understand what I'm talking about whatsoever? to pricing to, oh, you, you place an order and I'm literally hand shipping it to you to get some feedback before I go scale this and try to get it, you know, cause what the feedback usually informed the product design, especially with hardware, we would, we would take the feedback and we would do a small batch change to the physical product and then try again. Right. Until we got to a point where we thought like, oh, this is good. We're dialed in and now let's scale. But I just feel like even though we say landing page, there's so many little things you could do and have it evolve over time. Versus just like throw up a really pretty page and then collect a bunch of emails and then a month, a couple months later, release your product and expect they're going to buy. And then they don't even know why they signed up and they don't know who you are anymore. <laughs> like there's like, you can interview them. You can, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. So that one I see um, being used, but maybe not being used to its fullest potential. And then with search trend analysis, what I'm seeing is you take what you're from your customer interviews and discussion forums and you use it to inform your search trend analysis. So like the challenge with customer interviews is that it's usually a small batch and you can't scale them because it's just you and maybe a small team, but you can take the notes from that and you can plug that into search trend analysis, like Google keyword planner or answer the public or Google trends. And you can start to see like, are there more people like this? It's kind of like a lookalike. Well, Facebook calls it a lookalike program or meta, but you're trying to see, are there more people like the small batch I interviewed around the world and then uh, I smashed my mic there. And then, um, can I, can I do searches and see like, are there thousands or hundreds, like hundreds of thousands of people searching for this and you can start to get a feel for it versus, um, just that small batch and placing a really big bet on, let's say 15 customer interviews, you can back your way into search trend analysis and see, are there a bunch of people quantitatively all around the world, observable evidence of them searching for a thing. 
which I mean, it's not super strong evidence, but it's a little stronger because they're actively seeking a solution to it. So there are all kinds of cool things that you can do. Um, have a question. Will you put those resources in chat? Um, I have them in a board. So what I can do is I can dump them in this board that you'll have access to for a while. I'll just put, it, put them down here. I'm going to shrink this one because I'm glad you're learning Mural, but I'm going to make it a little smaller. So I'll put like, um, what can I do here? I'll just put uh, testing tools. And then I'll copy them in for you. Uh, I'm not affiliated to any ones I'm talking about. They're just tools that I use. So that would be better than chat. I can dump them in this board and you can click on them. Awesome. Um, Brian, anything else like that I said there that was like an aha or anything that you might like change the way you're approaching this? Um, this is, no, it's great because the running of the experiments is not my forte. So the use of them in together and integrating and leveraging, leveraging them is great, especially in you know, technology, things like landing pages, uh, especially the social media use and you know, uh, search trends. So very helpful. Hopefully that helps someone else you know, speak up. So now you know you're not gonna get uh, you know, laughed at and eviscerated. So uh, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I mean, it's some people's style. It's not mine if you haven't figured that out yet. So it, it's cool. If you have something great, if not, we can move into Q&A. Anybody want to jump in? Looks like we have a raised hand from Mary. Go ahead, Mary. Hi. Um, so I, I just have an idea. It just came to me um, while you were talking. Um, I'm new and I'm trying to do a career switch. And I'm in this um, very big group of over 60 women who are learning how to code. Um, but I think, and we're primarily like Im immigrants, new immigrants and um, minority women. Um, and they're mostly all moms. So the issue would be that um, they have sometimes like their, they have credentials from back home, um, but they don't have like credentials here or they don't have like work experience here so I I've been thinking about a way to do something like I think it's in the experiments like a referral program um so I'm the purple I'm the purple um stickies that are down there um in a way that maybe we can build a community to help to vouch for each other um, since people are more experienced than each other. Some people have like 20 years in sales back home and then they come here and they're basically working like at a grocery store at like cashier. Um, some people have um, programming um, like uh, what do you call it degrees in like Java but they don't have um, what is it, experience. So I'm just thinking about this right now. It, it's not something that I've thought about before, um, but maybe there's a way that um, this, can, this can happen like on a community type of level, mm, maybe partner with like institutions that are accredited, but I don't know. Um, and maybe to do some kind of like so social um, crowdsourcing for each other, you know what I mean? So that's my idea. Very cool. I, I think it's interesting. It comes from like a personal, you know, a personal uh, challenge, like a personal pain point. Also, I would, anything like this is like a matching or trying to help people. I, I tend to recommend to keep it like really small at the beginning and do it a lot of manual. So maybe like a concierge um, and just see like what works and what doesn't. And then once you get some of these, then you can kind of back your way into something a little more automated. So like um, one of the peers I used to work with, you know, she has this um, uh, like mom's group, right? And, and and they all have new, like basically um, new, I don't say newborns, but uh, you know, toddlers, newborns to toddlers. And 
they're really struggling with all these like conflicting uh, feedback they get from friends and family and doctors and all this other about like what how they should navigate all that about like learning milestones and also what they should buy for developmental for like their kids at, like what point should I buy like a bigger car seat and all this other stuff and uh, she, first off, she's, she's like, she's really an expert in that stuff. And so she was just like texting them. Like she had like a mom's group that would text her for advice. Right. And then she started saying, well, maybe I could pay for that. Like maybe I could charge for that. And so she had a website and then she, she still manually responded to everybody, but they would pay like a, a monthly fee. Right. And then she learned from that. And now she's creating like this automated, like bot system that would give her recommendations at a bigger scale. And that shows she can scale it and she's raising funding for it right now. And so I just think like something where you keep it really small and intimate and you learn a lot and then you can use that to kind of um, inform going bigger potentially. It depends on how big you want to make it. But um, I feel like some of the stuff you've chosen here, just like as long as you're keeping it small and seeing like the value exchange and the feedback you're getting from folks. And then from there, you can kind of use that to inform anything that you want to scale. Um, but yeah. So I think anything there, I think referrals work. I think concierge works, surveys, uh, landing pages. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff. You have a lot of flexibility what you could do in that space. Looks like we have a question from Leslie. Yes, hi there. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you after reading your incredible book. <laughs> oh, Just thank you. absolutely incredible book. Just mind blowing. Um, I have a company that is a pre-seed company that is going to be the global green alternative to Amazon. And uh, the people that I'm trying to get at it are um, CSOs, chief sustainability officers and chief human resources officers, because we have a B 2 B to C model along with a B 2 C model. And uh, our marketplace can be used in a number of different ways, uh, employee benefit, uh, employee customer partner, supplier incentive recognition reward, et cetera. We have tried a lot of things. As you know, investors look for traction. We're, we're looking for investors. And uh, we obviously cannot show them revenue because we don't have the money to build the platform. So chicken and egg kind of routine. Uh, working on the prototype right now, two months away from the final patent on our algorithm that's a special sustainability algorithm. And uh, the key that we're having problems with, I, I'm using my social media team, we've been using graphics, question graphics, um, surveys that are particularly aimed at sustainability officers and human resource people. We've got, um, uh, yeah, online surveys, graphics. The key for us, other than the prototype and the patent, is trying to show that a ton of people want this. So on our landing page, we have a sign up where somebody could be a seller, a, co a consumer, and or an organization saying, yes, I want it. Yes, I'll buy it. We want a massive list of, of people like that so that we can show that dish as additional traction to potential investors. And so I'm just want to, and I, I, I'm just grasping at straws and I've done outreach on LinkedIn. I have 19,000 followers and I'm just tearing my hair out. Of course you get the people that are like, you know, you ask them, can I just have 20 minutes? And we all know how that works. You get a bunch of these people all the time saying, can I have 20 minutes of your time or, you know, and, I'm just tearing my hair out. So I wanted to throw all this spaghetti on the board and see if you have any ideas. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, well, it's not great, but it's, it's a good spot to be in. So uh, let me share with you something that might help. Um, I have yet to see this fail. Now, I'm not saying it will fail for you, but... Um, <laughs> Yay! Oh, you just got my hopes up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just setting unrealistic <laughs> expectations right from the get go here. Um, I don't know if it will actually let me. Let's see. I don't know how this is going to paste in. Okay, it pasted in. Okay. All right. So I got this from uh, Jason Cohen out of Capital Factory in Austin, uh, who uh, Brian actually might know. Um, I've yet to see this one fail. Now, this, this. So let me walk you through this format. So basically, you could say I'm the founder of blah blah. Right. And it's designed for folks like you. So I'd love to talk about any pain you've got with, and if it's going to be sustainability related, right? All that stuff you're leading with. Now, here's the key. It's, I know your time is valuable. I don't want to feel like I'm trying to grab time from you. So I'm very happy to pay you. This is really interesting. Pay whatever you think is fair for an hour of your time. The great, the great trick with this is that they never 
take you up on it. And so if I, you're hope, trying... I hope so, because we can't pay them. <laughs> 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 we cannot pay them. I'm like so not in a position to fund my business. It's like not even that's like an understatement. <laughs> right. So it's up to you, right, whether you put that line in or not. However, um, I have not yet experienced anyone that would actually say, yes, I want you. I want you to pay me X. It's it's almost always a, as a filter. So anyway, I'll leave this in here. Um, but basically, I mean, if you got, you're on the board, you can just copy and paste it, or I can I can put it in chat too. Oh, that would be great. Um, if you put it in the chat. This yeah, so I'll put it in chat for you. There it is. Thank you. So yeah, it's interesting because I've been doing the I've been doing the part the front part. I've been doing the the middle part because I know that um, these these organizations are losing customers. They're losing employees, partners, suppliers, and investors for lack of action on climate change. And so I know they have this pain point. The numbers are there. You know, I've done enough research and I know the market well enough, but the key is just getting them by the neck and getting them. And, and then the frustrating thing, which you said, which I also have known because I used to sell surveys is what somebody says and what somebody's going to do are two totally different things. So if I show investors of oh, this many people that I talk to on LinkedIn, you know, said this and that and the other. It's just like the two surveys that I have put together, the one for the sustainability officers, the one for the HR people. I could say until the cows come home, I have all these people and they told me this and this and this, but, and they're going to do this and this and this. Um, how do I get, that's where that sign up on the landing page is. And luckily I have two kids in New York City who, started a digital marketing agency and they love what I'm doing. And so they are, as we speak, overhauling my entire website and uh, spiffing up and tweaking the landing page with all the little bells and whistles that they know about and that I don't. <laughs> That's good. Cause that was my second question. I was like, well, we can just pull up your page and live review it right now, but it sounds like they're already, uh, they're already working on it. But I would say, um, it, again, maybe you don't spam this to hundreds of people, but I would say, try it. And, uh, and, and like, uh, some folks are in chat are like, Hey, that we've never seen anyone take you up on the payments part of that too. So I just, it's something to think about. Um, I could also even offer a trade of one of my other, I have a consulting company, so I could say, I can offer you a trade of an hour of whatever consulting on, you know, whatever, but this little blurb, you're doing that by your messaging, right? Or are, are you also doing it out as a post or are you uh, doing it out? Not as a post? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so just one on one, you know, and you're going to get people obviously that never respond to you. And this is the thing that's annoying. Yep, I agree. Uh, so this is something I would only use as a, as a message, a private message. And then, um, yeah, and LinkedIn's weird. I would say what's like working for me with LinkedIn, uh, and it may not be your style, it's just like funny videos and photos. It, it's like I just post memes anymore. And I've hit up to 3.5 million views on one LinkedIn post doing it. And wow. it's pretty silly, but like, so my thing that works for me is I try to educate people and make them laugh in like less than 15 seconds. And, um, I'm doing it for more brand awareness. I'm not trying to, you know, scale a business with, you know, I, although I do target big companies, but, uh, for me, LinkedIn is, is kind of wonky right now. It, it's almost like, it feels like, um, it feels like Twitter, like five, 10 years ago <laughs> on how people use it. And so I just take the stuff that worked for me on Twitter five, 10 years ago, and I try it on LinkedIn and it works. So <laughs> I don't know if that helps you, but well, um, it does. Yeah. It actually does. Cause what I do is I intersperse um, news articles about climate change with our ads, our different ads that we have. And then to your point, humor, like when some of the late night comedians have segments around climate change, or I have a bunch of cartoons that are climate change related, th throw those up there. And, you know, it seems to be working from gaining followers, but it's, it's what it, what do you do? You know, um, we have two explainer videos that were, we've completed one for consumers and we're working on one now for businesses, but um, the funny thing is something I'd like to really implement on TikTok. And I have a person who's looking to start that for me. So, okay. yeah, so yeah. humor and education. And, and you would say like less than 15 seconds kind of thing. Yeah, I never go. I, oh, well, not ever, but I, I tend to kill it at 15. Yeah, so I'll find a snippet of 15 seconds worth. 
but um <laughs> yeah and then another thing that linkedin added was the featured posts and that's been working for me where i have three or four things pinned to the top of my linkedin profile so that when they do follow you so nineteen thousand followers is pretty good i think i have twenty four thousand or something so not many more wow. um wow. but what happens is that pinned so i've been i've been experimenting with that and so uh, I pinned some of the most popular LinkedIn posts there or ones that I would want people to interact with. And then I noticed they interact with them. And that's the problem with LinkedIn is um, once it's gone in the feed, it's like gone forever. And uh, if you're pinning it on your profile page, then they see it. And so if you have your explainer videos or like a funny uh, post that like a lot of people interacted with, you can pin it and then um, people will keep interacting with it over time. So that's, oh, that's usually, great. It's not, it's not perfect yet, but it, it's certainly... It's kind of like a pinned tweet for Twitter, but it's it's like you can do three or four for uh, LinkedIn, and it's like they show up in like a little carousel thing above below you. So, oh, I love that! I love that. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Yeah, I have my product desk cycle uh, pinned there because everyone it, it comes it gets popular once a year at this point, and I, I just want to take advantage of that popularity when it happens again. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Like, okay, that's um, my post. Like I'm the guy that created that, which people don't know at this point, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have, I have attribution problems. That's my biggest challenge, but anyway, um, hopefully that helps. Hopefully oh, that helps. it does. It totally does. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, a couple things. One is I want to paste this in, uh, in chat for you all. So I do have some stuff coming up. Um, and this is also in the board. I'll put the testing tools after our talk today. So you can just, if you have the link to this, um, you can just come back in. But basically there are a couple of things. Uh, one is that, uh, well, the big one is I run a three-day masterclass with Alex and the next one is in uh, September. So it's pretty close. And so we're running three days. It has live music. It's crazy. It's virtual, but we literally have bands show up virtually for the breaks and stuff and the intro. It's pretty cool. And we go through a lot of the content in the book, but we go through what we've learned since then and all that. So if you want to meet peers and stuff, it's a really great uh, experience. And then I have my cohort, which, um, I just wrapped up July. I haven't launched the fall one yet. It'll probably be October, uh, but you can get on the wait list. And that's a nice like middle ground if you don't wanna do a giant conference and you wanna just hang out with me and like 15 or 20 other people and work on your real ideas, then it's a 10 day program that I do online too. And so think of like what Seth Godin does and people like that is very, very similar to that. So those are things that I'm up to. But overall, um, you all are great to hang out with. I, I We covered quite a bit. <laughs> Like in an hour, it's kind of my style, um, but we covered themes of risk. So desirable, viable, feasible. We covered the um, uh, the canvas and how we've updated the canvas to kind of reflect those themes. We went through a bit of strength of evidence. We went through assumptions mapping. We we talked a little bit about the structure of the experiments and how they're kind of laid out. We just didn't have time to get through all 44, of course. And then we kind of like riffed on what a sequence might be for something that that you worked on and I shared kind of a, a fun example that I've worked on in the past. So overall, hopefully, you know, you have a little better idea of how to think about your risk. And then, um, you know, if you have the book, it goes into more detail, obviously, but it, you know, just to like find a little process for you that works, you know, um, that helps you kind of like keep doing this repeatedly. Cause very rarely is it just one experiment and it's a success. It's quite often, I ran experiment, something I completely didn't expect happen, happened. I learned something new and then it impacted my strategy. And so if you look at the winding path of any successful company, um, there's a good chance they started out as something else, you know, like DoorDash started off as like tablets in restaurants that was failing. And then when they were doing an interview in Palo Alto, they overheard a manager at a macaroon shop, turned down a delivery order. And they're like, oh, why'd you turn that order down? And they're like, well, we don't have people to deliver and blah, blah. And like, that's how they stumbled onto DoorDash, right? Like, so there's so many of those stories out there of companies and how they, like, and you look at them now and you're like, oh, they must have had like a single brilliant idea. And then they just scaled it. That's almost never the case. It's almost always, they had something, it didn't work. They tried something else. Oh, they learned something completely different. And then they like stumbled onto something that worked. And so just keep that in mind. If you feel like you're not good at this, or you're failing in some way in like a big way and not a small way, it's just a pretty winding journey to you get to something that works. So hopefully this gives you some more tools to think about that. And awesome yeah. stuff. Any last quick questions? All right. Um, I wanna say thank you, big thank you. Maybe we can all hear, uh, give your emojis, the virtual Zoom wave. Thank you, um, Dave, it's awesome to do this for us and really uh, help the uh, ecosystem, not just here locally, but around the world. We got 
I know I saw Jordan coming in from West Africa. So that might be one of our farthest. That's awesome. So we, uh, we are global in nature, reaching the world from Sacramento. Um, Cameron, any last thoughts? I'll throw it over to you. Awesome. Well, uh, just echoing the appreciation, David, for coming in and sharing your experience and knowledge and all the tools. And thank you all for coming to the to the workshop. I did throw some links in the chat. Um, the first two are the same ones that um, David shared earlier for his cohort, as well as the master class. So be sure to check that out. And then just um, quickly going to walk through some upcoming resources. So one of our previous guest speakers, Josh Levine, he is rolling out a uh, culture uh, summer school. So you can hop on LinkedIn and check that out. Um, coming up on August 31st, we will have uh, our startup happy hour, um, which will be e with Idris from Engage3. And then we have uh, the Center for Small Business has an information session. So as a small business, you can learn about how you can get student support. Um, and then on August 16th, I believe we have a session on OKRs, um, Driving Focus, Alignment and Engagement. And that's with Ben Lamort. And then lastly, there's two cohorts that you can join. One, uh, today is the last day to apply for the Lean Innovator cohort. And then you can join Brian and I for our certificate program. Um, and that will be kicking off in the middle of September. So feel free to hop into any and all of those links. And uh, we look forward to seeing you about the ecosystem. And um, thank you again, David, for the time and sharing your expertise and for all you entrepreneurs of taking the risk to build something great. So have a great rest of your Friday and look forward to seeing you about the ecosystem. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too.